My name is Alex Pavlak, Program Director for the uh, Chesapeake Chapter. I want to thank you all for coming here tonight to listen to our lecture. Uh, and uh, in particular, I want to thank John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory for providing the facilities for us. Uh, our lecture tonight will be broadcast live, or is being broadcast live. And uh, so hold your questions to the end and uh, wait until we get a microphone around so that uh, the uh, folks who are on the internet can uh, hear your question and the answer. Uh, for those of you who are on the internet, you can email a question in. You email to uh, encozy.cc, um, Chesapeake, encozy.cc at gmail.com. So it's encozy.cc at gmail.com. If you email your questions in, we'll address them at the end of the lecture. Uh, so without a further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Ann Darren. Uh, Ann is an executive here at the uh, John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and uh, she has been the author editor of a couple of books, including MEMS for Aerospace Applications and uh, Systems Engineering for Microscale and Nanotechnic Technologies. And we'll be talking to us tonight about uh, applied system engineering methodologies for uh, uh, micro and the nanoscale ramp realm. And with that, I'd uh, like to introduce you to, I'd like to introduce uh, Ann. That on? Good, I feel like I'm in a 12-step program. Hi, I'm Ann, and I'm not a systems engineer. Okay, just going to put that right up front. I'm not a systems engineer. My background is as a technologist, more or less. Um, uh, I did go on a journey, and I want to introduce Janet Barth. Would you stand, please? Janet was the co-author of this this journey that we took, and it, and it, yep. And so I'm going to talk to you about this journey, and we're going to talk about uh, looking at uh, uh, nano and micro micron scale technologies and um, how to approach them as a system. The journey took us, so I'm going to talk about 10 to the negative 6, and I'm going to talk about 10 to the negative 9th meters, so we're going to get very, very small here, okay? So everybody's very small scaled if you're used to that kind of stuff. Now, we're going to jump at the end, we're going to be talking about nano. Um, NASA declares a nano satellite at 5 kilograms, so I don't even want to think what a macro satellite would be if you're going to take that up. Uh, you know, uh, 10,000 times or so. Quite interesting. So I'm going to start in there. I promise you it'll get a little more interesting because I'm going to start, I'm going to get through some material, the drivers and part of why I went here and went on this journey. And I promise you we'll show you a movie of bull sperm. Okay? So I've got that in here. So it'll get a little more interesting, so just bear with me at the beginning because I want to get through some material. So I started off very frustrated here when somebody handed me the job of, oh, MEMS are hot, MEMS are new, and go be an expert in MEMS. That's microelectromechanical structures. And I started studying it, and we kept, we kept developing little MEMS devices. And they would say, one MEMS device, one PhD. And you'd start making these little MEMS devices. And what was happening was we were a technology, and we were a solution in search of a problem. And we weren't getting anywhere in this world, absolutely nowhere at all. And that really bogged me because it was like, there's something wrong with our approach here. Now, of course, anybody that has a cell phone, you've got MEMS accelerometers. If you drive a car, you've got MEMS accelerometers that deploy the airbag. So now they're everywhere. They're ubiquitous. But at that point, they really weren't. And you were, we weren't making that jump, that leap. We were still doing, oh, here's a cute little widget. So let me start on in. So pretty famous stuff. In December... 29th, 1959, Richard Feynman, very famous physicist, gave a lecture entitled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. This is really, really key because of the idea he said, he didn't say there's room at the bottom. He said there's plenty of room in the bottom. This means this is really the next place to explore. We hadn't even gone there. Many, many new technologies. Nanotechnology is a relatively recent beast, and it has a lot of hype out there about it still. But... Plenty of room at the bottom. Today we have the micro and the nanoscale technology developments that have the potential to revolutionize smart and small systems. 
the application of systems engineering methodologies that integrate standalone small scale technologies and interface them with the macro world um, to build useful systems is critical in realizing the potential of these types of technologies. So this talk is going to talk, cover that kind of activity and where this potential is and where we are right now. Currently, we are moved out of being a lab curiosity, and we are the realization of products. I mentioned to you the fact that we don't get nauseous when we turn our cell phone screen, and it moves around like that. So it's moved into aerospace, communications, healthcare, and numerous other arenas. Now, I'm looking at this not, remember, I am not a systems engineer. So this is my journey. So bear with me, because you all are the experts on systems engineering. Eric Dressler, very, very famous um, futurist, and um, Richard Smalley, very famous nanotechnologist, got into a debate in chemical engineering news. They did it in the opinion section, and it kind of captured the world that people were paying attention to this. And Eric Drexler said, to visualize how a nanofactory system works, you know, if I have a twanger here, I could move forward, huh, on my slides. Where did it go? It must have walked off. This would be so much fun if we stay on one slide, huh? Um, to visualize how, I don't know where it walked. It was here. We can hang with it. Uh, to visualize how a nanofactory system works, it helps to consider a conventional factory system. The technical questions you raise reach beyond, beyond chemistry to systems engineering, problems of control, transport, error rates, and component failure have answers involving computers, conveyors, noise margins, margins, and failure tolerant redundancy. No, no problem. Thank you. The traditional textbook approach to systems engineering tends to be a top-down hierarchical approach of reductionism and discovery which is used to understand the system. Now, again, I don't want anybody to throw bullets at me, but I'm going to say something that's, that's kind of been quoted a few times. Uh, and it works like this. In his appendix to the Rogers Commission report, our friend Richard Feynman, again, on the Space Shuttle Challenger accident, pointed out that NASA's over-reliance on the top-down systems engineering approach to design the shuttle's main engine resulted in the inability of NASA to assess accurately the reliability of the engine. Should I be ducking right now? I'm thinking. He also writes that another disadvantage of the top-down method is that as an understanding of a fault is obtained, a simple fix may be impossible to implement without a redesign of the entire system. Okay. He has some points there. Fortunately, Systems engineering is agile enough to adapt to a bottoms-up or coming into the middle approach, such as the case for space systems, where an instrument designed first and the spacecraft and the mission are designed around it, or when a spacecraft is specified and other parts of the systems come together. So I think I'm going to move on to a concept of bottom-up engineering, and we'll bring you there. Basically, I want to just tell you that the big thinkers in this field have all come to the conclusion that if you don't apply a systems engineering approach, you're not getting there. Okay. <laughs> Micro and nanoscale technologies are complex systems in and of themselves. In addition, adapting these technologies to the human and the environmental landscape requires that they are embedded within larger systems. This further increases our system complexity because the scale order between the macro and the nano rail is very high. It's over 10 to the ninth. Integrating systems across macro scale to nano scale regime poses integration issues related to physical properties. So we get the physical, electronic, chemical, which do not scale as they would in differently sized macro objects. For example, 
Van der Waal forces. It's Van der Waals. It's all about Van der Waals. Back to, we're thank Van der Waals forces because we're all hanging together right now, right? But surface tension, frictional forces increase. There are changes in fluid flow properties, um, melting point, and who cares about gravity when you get that small? You know that just overwhelms us at the macro level. But down there, they just don't care. So the realization of systems based on micro and nanoscale technologies is dependent on our understanding the complexity, the reproducibility, and the ability to interface with the systems within which they operate. Um, this was summarized by Alef Lynn and Moore who wrote, it is sometimes very easy to get caught up in what is scientifically possible and ignore the engineering problems that come with it. I would submit that's one of the reasons it has taken the time it took to move us from generation to generation of nanotechnology. And it was some of the reason why it took us so long to realize some of the benefits of the microelectromechanical devices, the micron scale devices. So what are the keys? Using um, criteria to define complex systems, um, what, what do these technologies do? They display emergence. Now you all are systems engineers. You understand the concept of emergence and emerging behavior. They may or may not be analyzed. Classical systems engineering approaches of decomposing, analyzing subparts do not necessarily yield the clues of their behavior as a whole. So you have to take a look at this in a synthesizing ability. So what we get into here in 1981 Akoff put forward the difference, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, between machine age and systems age thinking. And we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. But I want to take you quickly back to 1637. I was not around then, just making sure everybody understands. Um, and this is Descartes in 1637, whose principles are stated. Accept only that which is clear and distinct as true. Divide each difficulty into as many parts as possible. Start with the simplest elements and move by an orderly procedure to the more complex. Make complete enumerations and reviews to make sure nothing was admitted. This is the reductionist path. It's, it's been very useful. It works very, very well in systems engineering. However, I'm going to take you to the slide where I'm going to show you some of the ideas of the concept of machine age versus systems age thinking that Akhlop put forward. A way to an analyze a machine versus um, analyze a system in his mind. And this is a synthesis activity. So there are some that will tell you a lot of nanotechnology is chemistry. And they're very, very prone to think along the lines of synthesis. It's actually how they put things together. So when we think about putting things together, we're going to be talking about bottom up. It's a key, it's a key concept to nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. You can put a bunch of stuff together and you can create a nanoscale something. You can take stuff away until you get down to the nanoscale. When you hear about bottom-up manufacturing in nanotechnology and top-down, that's exactly what they're talking about. You can come either direction to get something nanoscale. Okay? So I can do the same thing to build up something micro, micron scale. Or I can come down and take away silicon and that kind of thing, and that's how you do certain types of devices. So that's the bottom-up and top-down approach. The bottom-up is very much a synthesis approach where you put things together. Oh, and here's an example. This is your example of a bottom-down approach and um, just taking things apart. In the synthesis approach, you just start putting stuff together and you hope something takes, and that comes from the bottom-up. So what we had is four basic generations of nanotechnology. The first generation is what they call passive nanostructures. So think about, um, oh, wow, my shirt doesn't wrinkle. That's got a coating on it. That's a passive nanostructure. That's some of the big products that they made originally with nanotechnology would be coatings like that, uh, bulk structures. The second generation uh, was achieved around 2005. So we're talking pretty recent stuff right now. And that's targeted drugs, activities like that, where you can get into um, 
Oh, they use um, active structures such as transistors, amplifiers, targeted drugs, chemicals, some actuators, some adaptive structures, structures that respond um, to activities from external forces. What we're into now, which gets really exciting, is we've come to the third generation. Now look how quickly these generations are moving, and they're only going to move faster. This is the third generation we're in right now. Bioassemblies, and I'll show you an example of one of those. So the fourth generation is molecular nanosystems, and if you guys have heard some of these principles of singularity, you know, and this real woo-woo stuff, many, many years ago, I worked for NASA, and they would put me on these committees. Now, i got to remember, this was many years ago. And they'd say, okay, tell us what's going to happen in 2020. I love these committees. You could say anything, because you know what it's going to say? I going to say, call me in 2020 and tell me I'm wrong. And I can't wait to hear the phone ring. Now, it's going to have to be my cell phone because I don't have a landline anymore. But part of my problem is the cell phone. Let's talk about that real quick. The cell phone, you have so many micron scale components inside that cell phone. Yet our problem is this, our fingers. You can't get that cell phone too small. In fact, remember when they came down, the little tiny, all these people went out and got these little tiny ones. They hated them. They went back to kludgy ones because they just couldn't. So here, that macro to micro interface is so key because it's just not usable if you can't interface with it. Now, there's other ways to interface with it. We now have our dear friend Siri, who you can talk to, who has no clue what I'm saying. So I actually think I'm, I'm an alien, and you guys are looking very nicely at me, but you can't understand a word I say because Siri can't. I know that. So, you know, I've got this invisibility with her. So... There's, we're in this third generation, going into the fourth. What's really interesting is there's lots written about the fourth generation. I think it's the same thing about me. Go ahead, tell me I'm wrong. I mean, they can say, woo, woo, we're going to have singularity. Machines are going to run the world. They're going to design themselves, and they're just going to get smarter than us and go forward and multiply. Very little is written about our current generation because it is sort of emerging right now. We don't necessarily even know where it's going to go. So here we are in the third generation. So we now all, everybody understands bottom up and top down, right? When we talk about nanotechnology. This becomes really, really interesting because technology has just caught up. We have just gotten to the point where you can start making, we have an ability to take away so we can actually get to a certain scale. Well, we've also got that ability to build up to that scale. So we've actually now hit this really neat intersection. What happens at this intersection is I think we're going to be putting the third generation on steroid because now we've got different ways to get to the same conclusion. Pretty interesting stuff going on. And by the way, as you notice the time frame, it's kind of right now it's happening. So that becomes interesting. So how can we use this stuff? I did. T I promised you that we would um, see some bull sperm. Oops, didn't see it. Let's go back. Make sure. It was so fast, you're right. that's amazing. I'm sorry. That's, I think it's amazing. It's bioassembly. And the cool thing is, here you got this little engine that's just going to keep on going and going and going. Now you start imagining what you can do if you can do this kind of self-assembly in kind of external force or in force and build up massive structures. I think this is fabulous. I, I really do because you can go certain places with these small devices that you can't go. The body is really good about nanotechnology. It really likes it. It hates micron scale. 
You ever uh, anybody in here who's got allergies knows the body hates micron scale. If it sneezes it out, it doesn't really like it. Nano scale, eh? It's part of the body; it likes it. So I am not to get too personal, but we're all buds now, right? I'm a cancer survivor. This is a very primitive thing. What do they do? They slash you, they poison you, and then they burn you just for fun. And they do it to the whole body. Let's have chemo. How fun is that? I didn't have cancer through the whole body. I have a little tiny place. Wouldn't it be nice to get there and just give me the poison just where I need it? I really didn't appreciate the whole body treatment, you know? So anyway, this is really fascinating stuff. And if you start thinking about where we can go with this, and there's whole factories at a scale that is just hard to imagine. So one of the things that happened is that you're dealing with a technology that's totally in a transition. We're just on the, the cusp of not even knowing what we can do with this. So that took me into the systems engineering journey about, you know, how do you deal with technologies on the transition? And I got introduced to Agile Software Systems Engineering and the Agile Manifesto through this work. And it was pretty interesting because I found that awful lot of the principles that were in Agile, currently we are shipping iPhones, we're shipping Google Glass, we're shipping things that aren't complete. I don't know what the app is. I don't know what the app is going to be next month. I don't know what's going to be. I don't know what's going to happen to it or where we're going to go on the journey. And we can exploit that uncertainty and we can exploit that development very, very much in if we keep loose and we keep agile. And that's what's happening right now with these different systems. It's really exciting. So getting into this, I got into the idea of where I could go. Oh, yeah, we have a little problem on top, down, bottom up. We're just not sure all this is going to work. Okay, once add slide, I work for the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. It's right here. It's right where we are. Got to do that. We have a huge history in space. So to introduce you, I'm switching over. Remember NASA said it thinks micron scale is 5 kilograms? Well, it over, but the things that I learned at the small scale, I applied to another small scale venture. So we had a problem. We had to build some nanosats. Remember, they're about five kilograms. And we were, we were over budget and out of time. And we didn't have a complete design. And somebody said, Ann, you want to, <laughs> yeah, I think they have like loser on my forehead, you know. Hey, Ann, do I have a project for you? Come on over here. And it was right after I'd done this work on micro nano. I said, okay, not being terribly bright. Um, so getting into small scale, I told you in NASA, getting down to that five kilogram, that one kilogram, that's what they think you know, the nanosats are. They just have a different scale, that's all. But getting way down there. And APL has built big stuff. And over in the little tiny corner, over here is where we're getting into the stuff that we're talking about. So downsizing, remember I talked about scaling. Things don't necessarily scale one-to-one, -one, obviously. Volume doesn't. Um, mass doesn't. Well, mass does. But coming down, it doesn't work that way. You can't just say, I want to have a com uh, command data handling system. Now I want to have a smaller one. The, the components don't exist. It's a different type of approach. You've got too much heat. Your stick, you, know, you shove it all together like that, you're going to have too much heat. You just, you know, it just doesn't work that way. I wish it did. So we had to come into it, and we had a challenge. We wanted to make these small nanosats. We wanted to take advantage of the fact that you could launch these for really cheap, like the little university-grade satellites, but I needed them to actually work. And that was the real challenge. You had to get up there and survive the space environment and um, be used. You know, if the military is out there playing around with these things, they kind of expect that if they say, I need you, that they're going to get a response, that they're going to actually be able to do their operation. So they couldn't just be a demonstration kind of activity. Lots of limitations. Limited by the volume, power, aperture. Limited by um, uh, components we couldn't even get on there. We only had one momentum wheel. We can't have three. There's no room. Communication, thermal control, the fact that parts don't exist, and we had to use um, commercial components. This is a slide I'm not going to go into. It's really for an AIA talk, but it is about the different trade spaces that you use as you figure out what you can keep and what you're going to lose as you get into these small puppies. 
So we had to, and when I was being PM on this one, recalculate. I love that GPS in your car, you know, recalculating. So we did a complete, fully qualified spacecraft. We did a couple of them. And you can see this little puppy here in the, the thermal balance chamber with its arrays deployed. This is actually a vibration test getting ready to go into, and look how tiny and lonely they look in the chamber, and getting ready to go in the exact um, deployer that it would go up to space. So we can leverage off getting a real cheap ride to space, but um, we still have to work when we get there. So we had a mission. So we were doing an advanced concept technology demonstration for the United States government and then going into residual ops. The program management challenge, in-house into in development, I had 10 months to get to PSR. Severe cost and schedule constraint. In, um, we, it had to, we had to have an accelerated path and we couldn't take fixed requirements at that point. So I had 10 months and at that point I had five million in the budget and I had two spacecraft to build. <laughs> so I went back and I said, shoot, I am not a systems engineer, but gosh, they got some really good ideas out there. They've got some ideas that maybe I could utilize that I had discovered from, not that I had discovered, but I woke up and learned about when I was doing this particular path and looking at really new and emerging technologies. What do you do when it's brand new? And I looked at Agile Software Systems Engineering. And they had some really good points. And they had some really interesting activities that they did. And I said, well, let's play with this a little bit and use this on hardware also. So we went over to the hardware side of the house. I only had 10 months. Remember, the clock is going. And I felt like, you know, I'm in a game show. Dun, 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 dun. It was horrible. OK, got to do all this. So how am I going to do it? So we followed the Agile Manifesto. We put. We put an emphasis on engine and individuals' interaction, on working products, on customer collaboration. We embedded the customer with us and responding to change. We decided that we would embrace change and figure out how to use it to our advantage. That's one of the things that happens with nanotechnology and emerging technologies. So we had this kind of a crazy management approach where we did scrums. And those people in here that deal with agile software systems engineering, you'll, you'll know what a scrum is. But a daily stand-up of a couple of minutes. We had scrum boards. And we had the same kinds of techniques that they were using in agile. We, again, had the agile manifesto as principles. We had the, doc we had the documentation we needed. There were things that we had to do to make that due date. You know, where are we going to hold our configuration control? You know, what level? We're not going to take it to every single step. We couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford what we were doing. Organizational structure, we just flattened it right out. It was a lot of fun. We went to um, an Agile sponsor, which was wonderful. We had the team leads became deputies, had equal authority embedded the sponsor with us, which was wonderful. We did the whole thing of having a teaming area, you know, the skunk works. We named it. The people ended up going tribal. This I didn't understand at first. I didn't understand the concept of becoming a tribe. They had new names for everything. Our, our small satellites have gazebos. I mean, they came up with all sorts of names. They had new names for each other. Let's not even go there. But everybody had, a, everything had a new name. It was a new language. It was quite interesting to do this kind of co-location, deep dive, very intensive work. The development timeline, everything became nonlinear. We had to do everything in series with the emphasis on working product. Now, we did rolling wave pattern planning. We had the scrum daily. It created urgency and responsibility. Everybody wanted to get their yellow sticky off the board, and get a new yellow sticky. Sustain the project momentum on this whole project. And it, um, it launched in November 19th of 2013. They're very, very successful. But we came up with these key elements of a very effective agile team. We did not have fixed requirements. That's a very scary concept. That was a very scary concept at Hopkins at here, is that we didn't have fixed requirements. 
Traditionally, the way we build things here at APL, I'm talking a little bit out of school, so if anybody wants to quote me, call me Jim Peters, okay? <laughs> yeah, Jim Peters said. So we traditionally fix our requirements. We tend to, uh, forever in phase A, let's fix those requirements. Let's nail down every single one. And then we have constant schedule and you float it. And in our business, you try to go back to the government and say, hmm, need more money. I don't know if you guys have noticed, the government's kind of changed out there recently. They've been through a little bit of an upheaval about handing out money. So if the schedule slips, the cost skips and all that, and we have our fixed requirements, and then we just go and ask for more money. Well, I don't think, I think those days are over. I don't think we're going to be able to do that much anymore. So what we did instead was we had a fixed cost, fixed schedule, and we floated the requirements. The most fascinating outcome of this particular project, besides the fact two working spacecraft that are actually up there and flying and doing their job right now, they're named ORS Tech 1 and Tech 2, um, is that not only did they work, but the requirements that we ended up meeting exceeded anything we would have written down at the very beginning. By allowing ourselves to say, how far can we get? We only have this much time in schedule. We actually exceeded what we thought we would have done if we had, you know, in our rough estimate of what the um, requirements were at the very beginning. Very interesting stuff. The team had a lot of fun. That's the team. You see the stars? They, were, that was, they got into this whole thing about being deputized. I ended up being called the sheriff. I don't know why, but the sheriff. And they got into having some fun. I think we were going to hit the, rob the credit union that day. I'm not quite sure because we were always worried about cost. But anyway, it was great fun. And I have to say, so my journey into systems engineering has been incredibly rewarding for me. I am so fascinated by it now. Um, I wish I'd come earlier in my career to appreciating systems engineering. And I think the way it's evolving and some of the newer thought processes are just absolutely fascinating. And with that, I'll take questions. How's that? Uh, questions. Uh. Hi, Ann. Um, I want to ask you about the Agile process and how you ensured um, that you were moving toward a, a valid final solution, not just the best you could be, be, but that you were going to meet the overall drivers. One of the things that we did with this was, of course, we embedded the sponsor. So we always had the chance to do a sanity check. You also, you pick one member of the team to be the requirements monitor. At some level, you know a certain set of activities. We, for example, have to sit in a standard deployer. We can't change that external envelope. That's a constraint that's handed us. We can't violate that because we can't get to space. So you had one person who was handed that sort of scepter and said, watch it at every minute that we don't violate those constraints that we are handed because otherwise we just couldn't flow. So that was very, very successful. Yes, sir. Oh. Hi, Ann. So I have a question. So you say you have fixed course and fixed schedule and you have moving requirements, right? So for your project. So typically in system engineering, you get the requirement from the user. So how you uh, handle the fixed requirement with the user? Is the user is one of the team member with you all the time? And where they, yeah, I just want to know the process, how you're able to deal with the user for the fixed uh, moving requirements. This is a tough one, because you're going to have to educate your user on this one. We embedded the user with us, so that if we said, we think we can push this requirement this way, or let's test this, and it worked. The user had to on the spot say, yeah, I guess that'll, that'll be good. We can work with that. One of the problems we have, and you all have been there, probably, um, unless some of you are representing the user community, is that the requirements we lay out at the beginning aren't really what we need. And we always get into this kind of education process that we have. And we end up making, sometimes we end up meeting a requirement that we didn't really need to have. And that's one of the things that has crept into our acquisition system very much. 
and that's a hard one, but you have to have an enlightened sponsor that says, you know what, I'll take that risk and I'll get with you and, and hang with you. I was wondering about the you know, traditional V. You know, uh, on the left, your con ops are being uh, driven, uh, you know, by your customer, and uh, then uh, if you're going up uh, the right side, uh, your uh, you know verification. So, uh, how are you approaching it? Uh, because you had uh, entirely, it seems like you have an entirely different in between the left side and the right side, and then uh, did you make accommodation if they have to ever do any uh, software changes in space? Okay, let's start. There's two, there's two basic questions there. First of all, we had what you would see as very traditional gates. You can't get away from that. I don't know how to get away from that. I don't know if I'd want to. You have to have gates, PSRs and CDRs and things like that, because you have to actually stop sometimes and say, are we really where we want to be? And did we meet the customer? And this is where we bring in and socialize with lots of the sponsor base to make sure. So we never ever threw any of that out. You can't. I, I'm not w willing to. Not if you're going to go do something critical like go to space. Your other question about, yeah, can you patch software? Sure, we can patch software. Um, interesting enough, we did something really radical that, that we've never done for anybody that's in here that's aerospace. We, we, we cannot do a full reload of the software. We can patch and patch and patch and patch. We have always designed our spacecraft so we could always do a free full reload. It's very complicated. It's very expensive. We can do a free, a full reload of that. We can wipe our hard drive and start all over. Never done it. It was pretty scary. You're pretty far away. It's not like you can like say, oh my gosh, three finger salute and we'll start again. It just doesn't work like that. So you know you can't send a repairman. So we have never actually used that option. I don't know if we would. We would sit around and have lots of meetings about it. So, so we don't even have. We didn't even spend the money or the time to to develop an option like that. We only patch. And by the way, look at your system. I don't know if you're Mac based. You don't have the problem I do. I'm PC based most of the time. <laughs> Let me tell you, patches are the way of life. You know. Could you talk a little bit? Uh, I'm Pam, Pamela Clark, um, NASA Goddard, and Catholic University. Um, could you talk a little bit about the hardware software interface? In other words, how you get to the to the idea of having a uh, hardware platform for app apps that essentially allow you flexible behavior, which is really what your user wants. Your user wants certain behaviors to emerge, as opposed to define exactly how you get to that system. How how do you uh, could you talk a little bit about that process? It's it's very interesting. It's a little bit along the lines. One of the things in the agile is is build a little bit, test, build a little bit, test, build a little bit, test. And so you're walking both paths of software and hardware with the embedded system approach. When people talk about agile in systems engineering and they talk about hardware at all, they're almost always talking embedded systems. And you get down to what they're really talking about when you read the literature is they're talking about a component where they're embedding software in it. It isn't really like the awkwardness that we had where we're actually building hardware, building software, and having to start to mate it. And we build a little bit, test it, build a little bit more, test it. By the way, healthcare.gov I don't think was built like that. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. So, so you have this rolling wave. Now with the hardware, we had to go down, we sometimes had two or three or four methods being used at the same time to see which one was going to be the best one, because don't forget we were so time constrained. It was pretty interesting. Yes? Um, I, certainly fixed costs, fixed schedule. Ideally in research you say, oh great, I just do a best effort and turn over whatever I get. But it doesn't sound like that's exactly what you were given. So you had, you had certain minimum things you had to do that were not tradable, right? So can you give some, yeah, I mean, there, was it at the capability level? Like, well, we're not going to do a radio this time because that's, you know, size wave, blah, blah, blah. Or was it down to just at the performance level you're making your trade-offs? Because that, that constrains your solution. Just want to see how you guys handled that. Yeah, primarily, I think you really nailed it, though. It would be primarily at the performance level. And that got us into how the user would use it. Because you're talking about handing the users a new technology they haven't had. So when you go out and they say, oh, this is what we're going to do, they're going to be very traditional in their approach to how we would use it. Well, if you've got a new technology, 
are you sure you're going to use it that way? How are you going to use it? And it would merge, and it was emerging as we came along, as to how you might be able to use it. Well, if you had this option, would you use it this way? And that was something on the performance and primarily on how they would use it, the operator. That was so key having the user there, you know, to kind of make those trades. I'm Matt Meyer from the Army. Uh, Shoot, Marley, mainly I go places and you say something, and they're like, oh. I don't really have a system engineering question, even though I'm a system engineer. I have more of a technology question. So you talked about, and you've worked on satellites for a number of years, and you know that it's, um, it's important to be able to communicate with and patch the satellite. You were just talking about that. And then you also showed an example of micro and nanoscale devices, perhaps robots that would, say, cut out cancer on the body. Um, how do you envision that same parallel mechanism working and being able to communicate with or patch a nanoscale device. Oh, they're going to have to have them do it. Remember Singularity? They'll have to do it. You'll have to tell it to do it. Ideally, it will tell itself, I need to be patched. So, for example, you know, it would say it has to have some sort of a full loop system where it's monitoring itself and has the autonomy to say, this is going the wrong direction. I think I have to do an error correct. You know, and for example, the way ants find food, you know, I just love ants. They, they find that picnic basket no matter what. They go trotting off and they say, I'm getting warmer, warmer, warmer to the food. And they say colder and they turn and warmer, warmer, colder, colder until they finally, they get there and it's very efficient. Then they all come there. You can actually do those kinds of things with nanotechnology so they can do their own corrections and, and that kind of thing. Um, you hope that they will be smart enough to figure out what they need to correct. And that's your smart system. There's your fourth generation. You can start writing the book. Yes. I want it. Yeah. The uh, field I'm in, RF communications engineering, is interesting in terms of the RF uh, agility. They're going to go to software-defined radios. But it still seems like they're talking and thinking about fixed structures and not flexible uh, hardware software as well as flexible waveforms. And I think for the future delay tolerant networks, that's where you're going to have to go. Can you address that and where, you know, I might be thinking if, if that is the goal? Oh, I think, um, well, RF engineering, there, there's a myth that it's magic. There's a little bit of truth to that. RF engineering is very interesting because you guys can't, there's no one textbook that will really tell you how to design a system and then you, it'll actually work. You're going to get somebody out there with some knowledge that'll start playing and there is a little bit of, um, you know, you have the, the radar uh, um, whispers, people that are just really, really good and they get around the radar and they go, oh, we need an antenna that's about 22 centimeters. Yeah, I don't know how they do that. They, they whisper it. It's like horse whisperers. They, they get in there. You know, that RF is, but RF has so RF has so much room for technology development. One of the hardware alone is fabulous activities for ability to have new improvements. The software-defined radio, of course, is going to have new. You're going to start getting these things will come together, and there'll be some synergies that will happen. The other problem you're going to have with RF is you get really kind of, we're getting really kind of polluted RF-wise in certain areas. So this is, you know, we're, we've become addicted to it. All we need is to have a Carrington event, and we're going to start all over. So it um, be very interesting to, um, to see where it's going to go. But I think RF is, um, is on the verge for many, many breakthroughs, including the software-defined radio. For example, we were talking the other day about building in your spectrum analyzer into, you can build a spectrum analyzer in theory in any, every cell phone. Now, out in California, one of the things they do is every cell phone has an accelerometer. So a bunch of people, you know, tens of thousands, are monitoring for earthquakes. Well, now you've got low fidelity, but you've got many, many data points, and you can actually really monitor. Well, think about that. You've got the same thing now. If we started saying, why don't we make a, spe a small spectrum analyzer in every single cell phone? Why don't we put, pull up an app that we could kind of do this? What could we do with that kind of knowledge base? Be, it's fascinating. I think there's a lot. I think RF world is on fire. And, and find those, if you guys can hire those radar whisperers and the RF whisperers, they're worth something. Okay, forgive me. I'm still stuck on that sperm. With, <laughs> was what was the point? Was someone steering it? You can actually put something. Yes, or was it? 
You want to answer it? Well, yeah. There's a new test as of last week. South Korean researchers have found they cloned bacteria in robots, and they put um, drugs on there. They look like sperm. But they had sensors that could detect and seek out cancer cells. You can Google and find it right now if you want. It's it's, a, it's an amazing thing. So you can, it, you, it can respond at this point. What it's doing is it's responding to an external. Remember, you cooled it down and you sped it up. So if you're doing, doing self-assembly, you could change it from temperature. You can change nanotechnology from pressure. And I'll talk about one that I really love that we talked about in the book, one of my favorites. You can change it by an external force. So it can react to an external force. What you're really looking at in this third generation is starting to act and having control of your change in and of itself where you don't have to have it external. Remember the thing about the great question about how do you fix it? Well, it's got to fix itself. It's going to have to understand excess, uh, uh, um, decide whether or not it needed to repair, and then determine how that repair must go, and then do it. So that's getting into your fourth generation. One of the fascinating ones, one of the ones I really love here, we have a technology here where we made, think about a nanoscale 10 to the minus 9th paint bucket. And in that, so you got this metal bucket, and inside you have paint. And you smash it, what happens? You get a mess. You got a bunch of paint all over the place. We had a wonderful technologist here that came up with a concept. Well, why don't I do this at the nanoscale? Nice little metalized paint. And I'll put it in the paint. So now, if you scratch that paint, It'll heal itself because you cut through this paint bucket, these nanoscale paint buckets, and they release new paint. Now, what happens when you think about the United States military and how much rust is out there and what rust costs us? It's amazing. I'm not talking about the military officers. I was talking about that. <laughs> but, no, but, you know, it's amazing what we spent. Think of the Navy. It's amazing what we spent. So you put this anti-fouling or you put this. So the minute you have, now that just responds. That's getting into the end of the second. It, Second generation, really, is just the idea that I put pressure on something and it changes its property. Because now I can put different things in there. I can have two pellets, paint buckets, at the nanoscale that have different chemicals in it. I can maybe change it from magnetism. That's always good. Um, of course, once you've got, you know, magnetism, electricity, and magnetism pretty much going the same, hand in hand, temperature, uh, RF. I could do it. I can do it UV. I can do, you know, I can simulate it somewhere externally. Down the road, you want to have it figured out itself and, and do, what, do what it has to do. Pretty exciting stuff. Any more questions? What's the power source for those little um, nanosperm? That's live sperm. They're, they're going to move because they don't know what. The metal, the robot, the metal, the metal robot, the size of the sperm. What's the power source? The one you can control it with magnets? Oh, no, yeah, yeah, there, there you just have something that's fair. If you're going to, it's got to be just fair. It just has to be something that can be magnetized. So if you put those little bull sperm in something, where they, they're just swimming around, they're swimming around, they get caught in this little head. Now they, they, they're an engine. They'll just continue to be an engine, this little head. And now if this head is, is fair, it can't. Oh, I see. They really crawl into it. You're, you're not making that up. Okay. You know? They get stuck and they just keep going. They live quite long, by the way. They don't have reverse gear. No reverse gear. <laughs> they can do all sorts of things, and they can actually do self-assembly and manufacture. It's pretty interesting stuff. Very exciting stuff. Um, you 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 mentioned moving off Earth again. Now you you mentioned with the satellites that you you haven't got a requirement. You were given the user new capabilities that they hadn't seen before. Now, having been involved in delivering systems to the military who have, you know, Acon Ops, you're giving them new, different capabilities, which allows them to remove features of their, their Con Ops and do things different, different ways. How, how did you deal with that? Because you clearly couldn't have just thrown the user manual over the fence, and you've you've got your one user embedded with you, but could they really have been expected to teach every everyone else? So I'm just interested in how you yeah. dealt with that. So you're following a very formal procedure. Remember, I mentioned about having gates. Um, 
Office of the Secretary of Defense has a program called Joint Concept Technology Development, which is the way you become a program of record. If you're a program of record with the United States government, they can buy more of you. It's a formal thing. Congress has to approve these things. So there's some formal gates there where you have to go in there and you have to you know, meet and have these reviews with the user community and see exactly how they're going to do it and process through these. So you have an op evaluation, a technology demonstration, independent assessment. The government has you know, lots and lots of reviews. So we actually had to go through all of those. You know, and you have to actually produce something that they... And it's hard because when you do a disruptive technology, it's very scary. I mean, you've got a lot of people there that were like, eh, I don't know if I like this, because it does change things. Just a quick follow-up to that. Did the student CubeSats have to go through those same gates or a similar process? No, but the student CubeSats, the student CubeSats should be called CubeSats. They're highly valuable. It's a great thing. Students go out there and build these things and take advantage of them. And they learn how to build a spacecraft. Wiki CubeSats and look at what they do. Unfortunately, most, most never get heard from again. Uh, the majority, over half, never get heard from again. The other ones that tend to do get hear, heard from might just be a beacon or something like that. There's not a lot of functionality. Poor Thomas Jefferson worked high school in Virginia, very famous. They launched a CubeSat. Um, last year, never turned on, but they launched a CubeSat. They can have take pride in that that they built a satellite. I think I'd be more proud if it actually turned on. But you know, you know, they launched something up there. Did anybody tell us we have a little space debris problem up there anyway? But, you know, so that is a hard one. It's great. There's a huge value in it for the educational system, but we have to say it's a little bit. I have to be careful. We've got NASA employees in here. It's a little bit like growing tomato seeds in the shuttle. You know, I just don't understand the tomato seeds in the shuttle experiments. They're really expensive, and nobody's going to become a crop farmer of tomatoes in the shuttle bay. It's just a kind of, it's cute, it's a stunt, but it doesn't, it doesn't really get me terribly excited, you know. If we don't have any other questions, we're going to wrap up. We have our ticket drawing for our book. Our door prize. Does anybody not have a green ticket? If you don't, John Baccio will come around with the tickets. We're waiting for the tickets to be distributed and collected. Everybody for coming tonight. This is, again, the first dinner lecture of our 20th anniversary year. So very important. It'll go down in history in 20 years when they look back at their 20th anniversary and it's their 40th anniversary. They'll say, 